This episode covers the senseless and grotesque attack on a young woman early one morning by an unknown assailant. Was it mistaken identity or a premeditated act? This is Vintage Murders and the brutal murder of a woman in the orchard. It's the morning of the 19th of July 1935 in the quiet rural Herefordshire village of Shobden. It was the home of 21-year-old Edith Nichols, where she lived with her parents at Hillhampton Cottages, together with her grandmother and uncle. She was quietly spoken and had been studious at school, but could be described as a bit reserved and rarely ventured away from the family home, unless it was with her mother. One of her jobs each day was to feed the chickens, which were kept in the adjacent orchard, and collect the eggs. It was a chilly morning, so Edith put on her mother's hooded cape, and after getting a bucket of feed, went about 30 yards from her front door on this routine errand. This usually took around 5 to 10 minutes. On this particular morning, her mother noticed that Edith was taking more time than was usual for this task, and after half an hour, went outside to the orchard to investigate. Mrs Nichols soon discovered the reason for the delay in Edith not returning to the house in a timely manner. There, lying face down in the grass, was the body of her beloved daughter in a pool of blood that came for a deep cut to her throat. She let out a scream at the gruesome discovery, and bending down over the body to see if there was any life, shouted, Edith's been murdered! A man by the name of Walter Long had just visited a neighbour, Mrs Powell, who lived opposite Hillhampton Cottages, and was returning home along the lane when he heard the scream. He immediately went to find out what all the commotion was when he came across Mrs Nichols, who was understandably in a shocked and distressed state. Mrs Powell had also heard the scream, and ran across the road to find out what was going on. Discovering the reason behind all of the upset, she set off to the local post office and asked the postmistress to summon the local doctor and the police, leaving Long with Mrs Nichols to do what he could to help. On seeing the body, he knew very little could be done except comfort the distraught mother. A small crowd started to gather, attracted by the unusual activity in the orchard. The local doctor by the name of Castles was soon on the scene where he pronounced that life was extinct of the hapless Edith. She had been killed by deep cuts to her throat and to her spine, broken seemingly caused by what looked to be an axe. The doctor also noted that the victim could not have been dead for long, since the hens were still finishing off the grain that they had been fed. He was joined shortly afterwards by three policemen, who made a quick search of the vicinity. They soon discovered the suspected murder weapon, a long-handled hatchet, heavily covered with blood, that had been discarded in the grass close to the boundary hedge at the side of the orchard. It belonged to Edith's father, who had left it on a bale of hay in a shed the day before. It was about 30 inches long and had a heavy five and a half inch blade. By four o'clock in the afternoon, the police had arrested a suspect who was taken to Wigmore Police Station and charged with the murder of Edith Nichols. Swift work by the constabulary. The suspect, it turned out, was Edith's 27-year-old uncle, Herbert Hughes, who lived with the family. At the time of the murder, he had not been at home. The police caught up with him near the church in the village. He said that he had left the cottage after breakfast that morning in order to go to the nearby village of Mortimer's Cross and was returning home. He had been apprehended whilst leaning on a gate to the local churchyard, but he denied being anywhere near the crime scene all day, expressing shock and surprise at the news of the death of his niece. During one of the subsequent hearings, a policeman stated that he was at Hillhampton Cottages 
on the 19th of July 1935 at about 10.55 a.m. when he was asked to go with another officer and look for the uncle. He said that they travelled through Shobden village and saw Hughes leaning on the gates. He said they went across to him and asked him to accompany them to Hillhampton Cottages and said that he asked what for, but that before they could answer him, he had turned and walked towards their car. The officer continued that when the uncle got into the vehicle, he asked the driver something like as to why there were all the police about that morning, but said that the driver didn't answer him. The policeman said that the uncle seemed to be very excited and nervous, that on the way back he was continually mumbling to himself, but said that no additional conversation took place. The officer stated that when they got back to Hillhampton Cottages, he handed the uncle over to his colleague in the wash house there. He added that during the time that he was in charge of him, the uncle was continually rubbing his right trouser leg and wiping his eyes and said that there were two marks on the outside of his right trouser leg, one just below his knee and one above. He said that the lower part of the uncle's jacket was wet, as was the right trouser leg. The constable added that the uncle had been mumbling and had appeared to be very distracted whilst he was with him and noted that when he left the suspect in the charge of the other policeman, it was 1pm. The other police officer who had collected the uncle from the village said that he took charge of him from 1pm until 4pm when he was arrested. He said that soon after he saw the uncle start to rub his right trouser leg on the outside by the knee whilst he was sitting on the box in the wash house. He said that he asked the uncle what he was doing that for and said the reply was to make myself look tidy. The policeman said he took hold of the trouser leg and found that it was wet practically all down the side and said that there were two dark marks close to the knee on the outside, one below the knee and one above where the uncle was rubbing and said they appeared to be like bloodstains. He said that whilst he was with him, the suspect continually looked about his clothes and was rubbing his eyes with his hands and was mumbling to himself. He said that when he asked him about it, he said that the uncle replied, Her mother and Edie wouldn't speak to me. I don't like it. They upset me. Hughes was charged with murder, even though he protested his innocence. The post-mortem conducted the following day revealed six injuries to the body, all of which could have been inflicted by the hatchet that had been discovered, which belonged to her father. There were deep cuts to her arms, suggesting that she had put up a fight in her defence. She had three deep cuts to her neck, the blows to the spine would have killed her instantly. It was also confirmed that she was a virgin and had not been molested sexually in any way. The inquest into the death was opened by the North Herefordshire coroner, Mr Southall, at Leominster Cottage Hospital, where all of the evidence, pathology report and the formal identification of the body were presented. The hearing was adjourned pending further inquiries by the police and because of a recent change in the law in 1921. If the coroner had been informed that a suspect had been charged with murder, manslaughter or infanticide, in the absence of any reason to the contrary, could adjourn the inquest until such time that criminal proceedings were concluded. Southall worked on the assumption that the magistrate's court would send the suspect for trial at the next assizes. As expected, Hughes was remanded in prison by the magistrate's court and sent for trial for the willful murder of his niece. He was granted legal aid for the case, as he had pleaded not guilty, and the court proceedings commenced on the 2nd of November in Hereford before Mr Justice Hawke. It became apparent that Herbert Hughes was not exactly a welcome guest at Hillhampton Cottages. He had moved there when his mother died in 1935. He had been fond of his niece, 
but there had been some sort of falling out concerning comments she made about him, and both of them refused to talk to each other as he went into a prolonged sulk. This understandably caused friction within the family. The reason for this falling out between uncle and niece was over something so trivial that nobody could recall what it was. Everyone in the household agreed that Edie did not hold a grudge against her uncle and had continued to treat him kindly. Plans and photographs of the crime scene and the orchard were produced in court and it was noted that there was one place where the boundary hedge was not as dense and it was possible that somebody could squeeze through there. The prosecution insisted that there had been no stranger in the vicinity of the orchard on the morning in question, around the time of the attack except for a few local people going about their business. Walter Long, who had been one of the first people at the scene, did recall seeing Hughes, whom he recognised, as well as several other people, further down the lane. But crucially, it was a short time after he had left the scene of the crime, when the police had arrived and ushered onlookers away. Hughes continued to deny that he had been in the village during the morning, and that when he was arrested, he had given the same account of his movements to the police. When Hughes and Long, after he had left the murder scene, met in the lane, the two men had engaged in a casual conversation. Hughes said that he had been for a walk, and he had left home at eight o'clock in the morning. It had taken him across the fields, rather than through the village. Long asked him if he had seen him early in the day in the village when he was with his wife and children. Hughes had again denied being in the village that morning and when he was arrested gave exactly the same account of his movements to the police as he had previously given to Long. A farm worker by the name of Stanley Porter gave a somewhat different account. His recollection was that he had been walking along the lane in the morning when he heard running footsteps behind him, coming from the direction of Hillhampton Cottages. He identified a person as Hughes, who would normally stop and exchange pleasantries, as they knew each other. But on this occasion, Hughes had seemed to be in a hurry, and hastily continued on his way towards the centre of the village. Porter said good morning, and remarked that the grass he cutting, and Hughes had agreed with him, and gone on his way. Another witness by the name of George Wilson, who worked at the rectory, recalled seeing Hughes at around ten o'clock in the morning, who seemed to be in somewhat of a hurry for some reason. A third witness, Sidney Fletcher, remembered a man rapidly making his way through the village towards Mortimer's Cross, and he identified the person concerned in court as Hughes. This is also been at around 10 o'clock on the morning in question. The doctor who had carried out the post-mortem on the deceased gave evidence on his findings. His opinion was that it would have taken a lot of force to sever the spine, as had occurred, so possibly had been done by a man. The perpetrator may not have been covered in blood himself due to the length of the handle on the murder weapon. At the time of his arrest, Hughes had not been covered in blood. The trousers that he had been wearing on the day had been sent to the Home Office for a more thorough examination. They found that it was human blood, and it was concluded that the traces would have been consistent of the owner having a cut on his hand, which would have left the smears that were found whenever the hand was put into the pocket. Hughes had continued to protest his innocence throughout, and never wavered from the account of his movements of the morning of the murder that he had originally given to the police. He had always maintained that he got up at eight o'clock in the morning, and after breakfast had walked to the village of Mortimer's Cross and back again, something that he had done a number of times in the past. The judge, Mr Justice Hawke, in his summary of the case, said that he could not see any direct evidence to connect the accused to the case before him. It was his feeling that everything that the prosecution had presented 
was circumstantial. The jury deliberated and came back with their verdict of not guilty. Hughes was discharged and free to go on his way. The case remains unsolved to this day. Rumours have persisted over the years, and no doubt many theories put forward. One such theory was that Edith was not the intended target, and may have been mistaken for her mother, as she was wearing the hooded cloak. It could have been Hughes because of his grudge, or even her father for some reason. We will probably never know who was the perpetrator of this most terrible of crimes. 